Hello and welcome to Tread Lightly, the podcast of two dinosaurs talking about books over a nice cup of tea. She's Trix and I'm Raptor and we're coming from Germany and Australia to talk to you about today's book, Good Omen. It's also Trix's birthday. According to the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which the world's only totally reliable guide to the future, written in 1655, before she exploded, the world will end on a Saturday, next Saturday in fact, just after tea. People have been predicting the end of the world almost from its very beginning, so it's only natural to be skeptical when a new date is set for the Judgment Day. This time though, the armies of God and evil really do appear to be messing. The four bikers of the apocalypse are hitting the road But both the angels and demons, well, one fast living demon and a somewhat fussy angel, would quite like the rapture not to happen. And someone seems to have misplaced the Antichrist. (laughs) Which I have to say is a great blurb, I mean. (laughs) It speaks very much so of the whole book. It's all really tongue-in-cheek humour. It's so good. Yeah, so... Well, I enjoyed the shit out of this book. Yes, I mean, this is my favourite book. This gets a 5 out of 5. No, it gets a 7 out of 5, not gonna lie. You can't just remake the scale. (laughs) No, I'm not remaking the scale. I'm just fucking with the scale. Yeah, I enjoyed this book a lot. I'm giving it 4.5 out of 5. It's a it's a really enjoyable read. You could probably give me uh, well, I got the audiobook and there are some bits in the audio book I don't really like, but I feel like if I read it, it'd probably have a five out of five. Yeah. Yeah, it's always tricky with audiobooks. You never quite know what you're gonna get. Yeah, and I'm just like the audiobook I think it, they did a really good job. I just am not an audiobook kind of person and Hmm. Uh, I mean, I also really like that it was a collaboration, because I'm not the biggest fan of Terry Pratchett, but I really like Neil Gaiman, and I think together they made, like, the perfect pair. Yeah, I agree that I think I really like Terry Pratchett's style of writing, but I don't necessarily enjoy his story so much because he spends a lot of time fleshing out these scenes and not really having a lot of plot driven stuff so i like i've read a couple of of his stories and like they're good but they're just a bit too long for the amount of plot that's there and neil gaiman there's a lot of plot going on and a lot of like things you have to be on your game with his (laughs) stories yeah So many things happening. I, I mean, Neil, American Neil Gods I read around. recently. No, he does not fuck around. I, so I read American Gods and the Norse mythology one. Jesus, mm. there's a lot going on. On your toes. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like it's a really good balance. They did a good job. And the, the story look, sounds like it was fun to write. Like they enjoyed writing this together. Um, yeah. Being a part of it, so... Yeah, I mean, there's a great, in the book, there's a great foreword in it where they basically just talk about how they wrote this when they were not big and famous, and they basically just did it as a summer job, and because it was a funny project, and they didn't realize what would come out of it, and the people who would show up to book signing and, and stuff with half fallen apart books that they read mm-hmm. so many times to get them signed. And it was just very wholesome. Yeah. I don't know. Just a good time all round. Good book. Enjoyable. Yeah. Book. I mean, it had me laughing on public transport out loud to the amusement of everybody. Yeah. So that's always I, good. I haven't been outside in a while, so <laughs> I, I can't really say the same thing. <laughs> well, the first time I read it, we were still allowed to leave the house. It was great. Back in those days, man. <laughs> Ah, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yes, when you were still allowed to sit on the train without a face mask. Boy. Yeah, I'm strongly considering making a face mask because I accidentally ripped my shirt 
And it's a perfectly good shirt aside from that hole. But it's a vaguely inappropriate hole. So I was like, well, I can make a face mask. That doesn't seem that hard. <laughs> I mean, I was lucky enough that a friend of mine made a lot of them. For oh, yeah? Every, for everybody. So I do have two very nice looking face masks. Also, I got some from the hospital, but they're just so sterile. Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised, one, that you are still going to the hospital and that yeah. they're not providing you with like, proper ones every every time you go. Well, you know, it's, it's a bit, I think we're a little bit short on supplies all around. Yeah. Yes. Well, should we get into spoilers? Yes. Spoilers! And I mean this. You pause this shit now and you go read the book. This is not an option. You do that now. It's a great book. I mean, if you see the TV show, you're halfway through the book anyway because they use so many direct quotes. Oh, I imagine that they. It's almost exactly the same as the audio yeah. book version. I, so I have the adapted audiobook version, version that came out in six chapters, six episodes, yeah. which is like the A same, show. but yeah, Aziraphale's even more flamboyant. <laughs> well, yes, because that's how he is. But um, yeah, the TV show, I mean, Neil Gaiman did the writing for the TV show, and it's just, it is the book. <laughs> In terms of adaptation, you can't get more honest than that. Pretty much. Oh, but it was a joy to read, really. Yeah, it is. Not to compare it to the world's most terrible <coughs> book, but for recommendations, it was a nice change from you. <laughs> I mean, and also, I, I like that it has all those little, I don't know what you call them, annotations, maybe, on the pages. When they go on a ridiculously long monologue about something and just have all those little stars everywhere, and at the end of the page they have to explain background to the very long page. It's well, just... I guess that's that's something that's missing from the audiobook yes. that I've got. I'll, I'll send you one or two pictures from some of the pages. It's just, it had me in stitches. It's great. <laughs> well, now I feel like I have to read it as well. Yes, uh... you do. What? Why did I even bother getting the audiobook? This is the I work. don't know. Like, I really honestly don't know. Because I have no time. Yeah. But... I was actually listening to it while I was working out. I was like, I have two hours in the gym today. Let's bother. It's very unhealthy to do exercise while laughing hard. <laughs> that sounds like hazardous. <laughs> Look, there's a couple of moments where I had to do my exercise, then come back and rewind it so I could listen to that bit again because I wasn't concentrating. But I'm getting through it. I'm doing all the things. I'm living the dream. Sure. <laughs> Oof. Rude. Just because okay, it's not no. your dream. Spoilery, spoilery, spoilery. Yeah. Please, bugger off if you're... Uh... If you haven't seen the show or read the book or heard the audiobook. Which apparently are all the same thing now. Yeah. Or maybe you just don't give a shit. Like, yeah, I mean, fair thing. enough, I guess. Fine, if you want to be that person, you go ahead. Look, I'm not going to lie. I am the kind of person that listens to book podcasts of books that I'm not going to read. So I mean, Same. Same. But we just definitely feel that you should read this book in particular. Yeah. We're very, we're very... Big on that point, at least for this book, for once. Yeah, across the universe, don't touch it with the ten foot pole. <laughs> Fucking hate it. No. no, 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 you burn it if you see it. Yeah. All right, cool. Lead us in with the plot. Alrighty. Well, first of all, we start in the Garden of Eden, because where else would you start a good story? And we just have the slight opener of, well, it's like seven days into the creation. It's all going kind of splendid until we have that little hiccup with um, Eve and that apple. We get the conversation between the snake and Aziraphale, one of the angels. <laughs> and I like the snake going, you know, I think he overreacted a bit there. You know, like, well, why even put the fruit there if you didn't want them to touch? <laughs> yeah, why not put it on a giant hill far away? <laughs> yeah. You can't put the 
apple there with a big sign, oh, no, no, please don't touch, and then put the woman right next to it. What's wrong with you? Ah, it's great. And then we have um, we have Crowley joining the party, who's a fallen angel. And here we have that great quote. You go ahead. It's one of yours. Oh. <laughs> so Crowley gets introduced to us as one of the protagonists with the quote, Crowley, an angel who did not so much as fall as sauntered vaguely downwards. And I guess I kind of want that as a description for my life in the end, you know. Yeah. Fall. That'd be good. They just sauntered vaguely downwards. <laughs> yeah, so we have Crowley and Aziraphale talking, and Crowley asks him what happened to that big flaming sword <laughs> that God gave him, you know. He had a big flaming sword. It was flaming like anything. And <laughs> Aziraphale looking slightly uncomfortable here and then admits that he gave it to Adam. <laughs> because, you know, they're all on their own now. Out there. They look so cold. <laughs> yes. They're <laughs> wild animals. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this is coming in uh, the actual book or if it's just in the audio book, but there's also some dialogue between the two of them, which is Along the lines of Aziraphale being the angel of the Eastern Gate, yes. and he's he's like, "What do you even What do you even need a gate for? Like, what are you supposed to be guarding?" And then he goes, "Well, like," he turns to Crowley and goes, "Like, I suppose I was supposed to be keeping you out." And it's like, "Well, yeah." And how did that go for you? <laughs> Not great. It's it's just great. They just. just from the very oh. beginning, we get those two as the greatest comedic couple ever. Ah, oh, yeah. I am such a fan of the two of them and the, just the dialogue that they have. And, like, oh, right from the get-go, there's clearly something between them. And you're like, come on, come on. Come on. This is the <laughs> beginning of time. Anyway. Yes, all right, move on, keep going. Oh, I just enjoyed the shit out of this. <laughs> um, it's just way less. I mean, no, just no. Um, yes, then we get into a slight introduction of Crowley, where we have the, the great revelation that the, M5, uh, the M25 in London was his creation, which... Most of the demons can agree it's one of the best demonic inventions ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ah, uh, it's just beautiful. And I think probably most Londoners would agree as well, so that's great. Um we also get in we also get the the story of his nineteen twenty six black Bentley that he loves yeah, more than yeah. anything in the world. Oh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm also a bit in love with that car. It is a very pretty car. And we also get um, get the tidbit of his love for Queen and the fact that any cassette that lays in the car for longer than 25 minutes turns into Best of Queen. It's <laughs> <laughs> just, just great. <laughs> and as somebody who has that cassette, it's a pretty good one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I would say the demons think so too. Yeah, look, I have a lot of uh, shared opinions with Crowley, and I'm a little bit concerned. Mm, okay. I think that's that's all fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yes, yeah, so we have Crowley riding in his car, and all of a sudden, over the radio, he's getting... he's being called by the other demons into a meeting, which has him slightly on edge, because he's, he's not that big into all of the demony jobs and all of the other demons. He lives a lot more like a human than anything else, really. Yeah. So he meets up with the other demons, and it's revealed that we have to start the, the chain of events for Armageddon. So the Antichrist is going to be born, or is already born, and Crowley is getting the very important task to deliver him to the family that needs to raise him. Uh, okay. 
so yes not much joy for him there he's not a big fan of the thought of the <laughs> of the whole event seeing how armageddon will destroy the earth which he enjoys more than well hell really or anything else if we're fair so we have crowley and just basket with a baby in it <laughs> very cliche and on his way to the hospital he goes and at the hospital it's uh, actually what is it a nunnery it's a sisterhood of sin s s s sorry <laughs> sisterhood of s saint beryl yes the chattering saint beryl anyway the word i was looking for was nope <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's um, the satanic it's um, there we go i got it out <laughs> That was the hard word, satanic. Yeah. Yes, I okay. got that. I'm sorry. So the satanic sisterhood. The satanic. Of the chattering order. Yeah, ch chattering order of St. Beryl. Which is just great. The order <laughs> being named after apparently a St. Beryl. And in order to worship Satan properly, they now have to be chattering all the time. Oh, except on Tuesday afternoons for half an hour, where they're permitted to shut up. And if they wish so, play table tennis. <laughs> uh, that that is missing from the audiobook version that I got. I'm a bit, yeah, it's, a bit mad now. It's the oh. annotations <laughs> that that are missing, which are some of the funniest bits in the whole book. Ah, uh, now the only the the bit that I had was that she was murdered by her husband on their wedding night because she wouldn't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean there are a lot of different um, different versions in the. In the laws, apparently, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so yes, we have the satanic nuns, which in itself is already great. That are there. I mean, the whole purpose is basically to help the antichrist on the way. So the plan was that this, that this family, or well, only the woman who is about to give birth, is supposed to come in, and they would switch her baby for the antichrist. Yeah. But so no, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, basically, they definitely want the Antichrist to be American, and they've <laughs> set it up so this American diplomat will end up with the Antichrist, so yeah. that they can uh, ship him off over there. I just think it's hilarious that these two writers just immediately went, oh, no, the Antichrist definitely has to, like, the intention has to be that the Antichrist is American. <laughs> yes, I mean, where else would he be from? Yeah, right? Definitely not Hanfield. <laughs> no, fuck no. So now we have the little hiccup in the plan where another pregnant woman is coming in, in labor, and this is where the whole mess gets really started. We have a couple of the nuns who are, well, oh, well, it's mostly, I think, just one of them, actually, that doesn't quite have her shit together. Not even a little bit. <laughs> and how would it else be? She's left to look after the baby for a moment too fucking long and manages to swap around everything in the wrong order. Yeah. So now we have so, the Antichrist with a small, unknown family from Tedfield. And that's just, it's not going to do. True. And the protagonists don't know. So I think a, a crucial part of this whole shebang is that the audience knows, but yes. our protagonists do not. Yeah. And there's... <laughs> There's also this great part of the book where I think it's Sister Mary, maybe, who did the, the accidental swapping. And um, she then talks to the other nun, and they're just completely, like, they think they talk about the same thing, but both of them talk about a completely different thing. Yeah. And the way it's described is just great, because you have, like, one of them winking to the other. And then you have three sentences going on. Well, she thought this ring meant this and this, but she thought the ring meant this and this. <laughs> yes, so basically everyone thinks that everything went perfectly well. Which is great, because now we have the Antichrist being called Adam. 
and going to live in Tatfield. And the baby, which was originally for the Tadfield family going to America, and the yes. third ba- the American, it's just kind of gone. <laughs> Baby's I'm gone. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure if they're just throwing him into the adoption market or what's happening here. But... Yeah, I believe that they mentioned that they, they sent him out to be adopted. Yeah, so that's some fucking mess. Yeah, then we we do have a lot of jumping in the book between different stories, different characters, and different timelines, too. Yeah. So next we get a quick introduction to Anathema Device. Who... It's a really unfortunate name. Yeah. It, I mean, it says her mother was a... Her mother just came across the the name reading one day and thought it was lovely for a girl. Uh, which is it, it, did it mean though. some something? I don't I don't think so. I think it's something they probably made up knowing all of their shit. <laughs> no, it does mean something. Someone or something that one vehemently dislikes. <laughs> What a lovely curse for a girl. Or council of the church excommunicating a person or denouncing a doctrine. That's great. With the Pope laid special emphasis on the second of these anathemas. <laughs> so there you go. That's why she's called anathema. Okay, I mean... Who thinks that's a nice name for a girl? Or for anyone, for that matter? Speaking it, next, next pet I get. Next dog, Anathema. Yes. You can yeah. it just nickname of like Anna, but like with one N. <laughs> yeah. What's what's uh, what's the Anna short for? Don't ask. Well, is it better or worse than the uh, American son's name? I mean, probably worse. I would say worse. Oh, really? I don't know. I thought it was pretty terrible what they named their kid. Anyway, <laughs> keep going. Um, yes. So uh, we get just a quick introduction to her as a kid starting to, to read not with colorful children's books, but with the book, which now isn't described any further yet. And we just get a quick, yeah, she's a bright child and... She's pretty and witty. Yeah. And, and it'll be fine, basically. In the audiobook, she asks her mom questions about the book, and um, her mom goes, I wish you would ask me questions I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> yes. Then we go back to the, to the nuns, where we have the uh, reveal of, I think it's Warlock, isn't it? Yes, Warlock. You don't uh, think that's a terrible name? I mean, it's not worse than Anathema, so it's it's equally bad. But, I mean, as a name for the Antichrist, it is quite fitting. It's now not the Antichrist anymore, but the thought is what counts, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Why not just call him Wizard and be done with it? <laughs> well, he's not a wizard. He's the Antichrist. We'll call him Antichrist. <laughs> a bit on the nose, maybe. I don't know. At any rate, everybody gets settled with their supposedly fitting children, and everyone's happy about the good job that they did. Then next we get an introduction to Newton Pulsifer. Oh, God. Which is just... <laughs> yeah, although I do really like um, this short bit where it's just about... A, ch- um, a child that loves anything electronic and digital and mm-hmm. anything that is electronic or digital that he touches just turns into flames. <laughs> it breaks down immediately. <laughs> it's... Ah, Poor kid. It, it's a sad, sad life. Yes, it is. I mean, all he ever wanted to do was like work with computers or fix, uh, fix devices and... <laughs> It's the one thing that he could not be worse at, even if he tried. Then we do... Yeah, I think we get one of the first um, 
meetings between Crowley and Aziraphale. About the birth of the Antichrist? Yeah. Where they're, yeah, talking about Antichrist. The inevitable yeah. plan. Like, yes. They have got that, that word. It's in the book about 15 million times. <laughs> I like it. Because as somebody who was raised in the church, yeah, this this is the inevitable plan. But it might not be the plan, which is important. <laughs> Yeah, so we do have them meeting and talking about this This baby is being born. I did the delivering. I mean, not the delivering, but I delivered him. <laughs> and we have this really great line because they're in, they're in St. James Park talking and inconspicuously feeding the ducks. And we have this, this great passage. Um, about the ducks in St. James Park are so used to being fed by secret agents who are meeting secretly, one of them probably wearing a, a brown overcoat, that if you took those ducks and put them in a laboratory and then showed them two men in coats casually standing next to each other, they will look up expectedly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, yes. So they talk about the whole... Um, about the Antichrist and everything that is starting up now and the fact that maybe this isn't the best thing to happen. Yeah. It kind of uh, interrupts their lifestyle and the things that they want. Yeah. And is it Crowley pulls out a newspaper and he's he's like, well, they're, they're hiring for people to work around the child. They're looking for a nanny and a gardener. <laughs> yes. So they're, they're getting the idea of influencing the, the child directly by simply inserting themselves into, into his life. Yeah, and I, I love it. Aziraphale's like, I call the gardener. And Crowley's like, well, f- I guess I have to be the nanny. Have you seen me in a skirt? Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> yes, it's great. And in the book, we also have that, I don't know if it was in the audiobook, um, we have that part of... I mean, first of all, they decide they're going to the Ritz and get drunk now. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we have a quick part where it's about the the Bible and it's the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> there's oh, one, I think I wrote this one down. Yeah, there's uh, one Bible version, a printed one, that actually has the, the, the original lines in it, basically, where you have the part in it of... And the Lord um, uh, spoke <laughs> unto the angel that guarded the eastern gate, saying, Where's the flaming sword which was given unto thee? <laughs> and the angel said, I had it here only a moment ago. I must have put it down somewhere. <laughs> Forget my own head next. <laughs> and the Lord did not ask him again. <laughs> yeah. No, but I got rid of that bit, is the follow up line. <laughs> uh, so, it just, yeah, it appears that these. Been- Editing the Bible for some time now. Yes. And, ah, uh, it's just great. Yeah, so we have those two getting royally drunk, which is great. And, like, Crowley trying to ex- explain things to Aziraphale, but he's so drunk that he keeps interrupting him with <laughs> useless questions. Like, I mean, they're talking about how if the apocalypse does happen as it is planned and how heaven and hell want it, then both of them will be stuck in heaven and hell. And yeah. Crowley just like going, that. yeah, Crowley just going, I mean, do you know how boring heaven is? There aren't any sushi restaurants up there. Mm. No good music, just classics. Yeah. The, we have, and we have all the best composers. Like, <laughs> yes. But apparently heaven has all the best choreographers. Not even remotely the same. <laughs> no, definitely not. But, yeah, and we have this this really great exchange where Crowley is trying to, like, make a point with the story about and the tallest mountain ever on the other side of the universe. And there's this bird that flies there once a year to sharpen its beak on the mountain and then fly back. And he can't get to the story because the zero fur keeps breaking breaking it up, asking questions like, but why is, how is he flying there? Is he in a spaceship? <laughs> so he flies there once a year in a spaceship. Ah, and it's just great. It's hilarious. 
but again another bit that's missing from the <sighs> yeah um, so yeah basically just read the book talking... don't get the audio book <laughs> yeah basically the whole point of the story was that even by the time that this bird is done grinding down the entire mountain with his beak you're still not going to be finished watching the sound of music in heaven I feel like that's a Doctor Who episode, isn't it? <laughs> Probably. I mean, it could be a tenant one. Peter Capaldi. No? no? Matt Smith, where he has to break down the giant, like, glass barrier thing. Mmm, yes. Anyway, moving on. Um, We're not so yes. nerds at all. What? No. Yes, yeah, so... In the end, they decide to sober up, and then decide that, yes, they have to do something about this whole apocalypse business. In the next bit, we get a quick introduction to the first horseman. Um, it's the horseman of war, I think, the first one. Oh, okay. Which is a woman who's also an arms dealer. Which, I mean, is fitting. And then, yeah, then we get famine who is just a guy in a fancy suit working for a big um, fast food company. Yeah, I kind of love it, though. Yeah, it is very it is very fitting. Um, next we get pollution, which used to be pestilence, but they had to update. <laughs> um, yes, who is just, like, having his fun, pressing the emergency cargo release. Um, on a boat that has some black sludge in its cargo hold. Mm, and before anybody delightful. realizes, he's uh, on to the next tanker that has some very rusty containers with nuclear waste on it. Oh. It sounds like a fun job. It would to you. <laughs> and yes, and lastly we get, um, we get Death as the last horseman. Which, I mean, it's not a bad guy at all, really. He's just got a job to do. Yeah. He's trying to get in ahead of the rush. Yeah, that's that's one of the that's one of the great quotes in the book too. Don't think of it as dying. Just think of it as leaving early to avoid the rush. And if that's not the truth, I don't know what is. So next we get Warlock's 11th birthday. Oh god, that was a shit show, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. I mean, we have like the birthday party and seeing how the family has plenty of money. Um, it's a big deal. <laughs> and we get Aziraphale doing his quote unquote famous magic, magic tricks. tricks. Which, not gonna Ooh. lie, he sucks at so badly. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if this was in the in the book, but in the audio book, he he's like, reach into the nice serviceman's jacket and you shall <laughs> yes. find a silver penny or something. And he like brings out a handgun. You're like, oh no. <laughs> yes. And then we are supposed to get the hellhound delivered, which is the apparently traditional birthday present. For an oh, empty yeah. price at 11 years. But the dog right. doesn't seem to show up. Which isn't great. We get um, we get one of the demons uh, calling Crowley. Asking if everything went alright with the delivery. Because he just got the info that the dog was delivered. And Crowley's like, fuck, there isn't a dog here. But yeah, yeah, it's fine. Everything went, went mm. good. Great oh, dog. Oh yeah, I see it good now. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, bad dog. Good choice, good choice. And then we get a, a jump to Tedfield, where we had him is desperate for a dog. <laughs> yes, and we we get like a couple of looks into the dog's head, where he's just like, I'm evil, I'm so evil, I'm gonna I'm gonna find my master. If my master wants me to kill people, I'm gonna kill people. And it's just like the evilest dog of all. And then yes. he's waiting in the bushes basically for Adam to show up. And Adam is, like, musing loudly about what, so badly wanting a dog. But not a big dog. He wants a small dog. One with a, an inside-out ear or something. 
Yeah, like all those random things that are very much not scary. So the hellhound being like the the custom dog for Adam is fitting itself to the purpose. Runs up to Adam and he's like, great, last dog, mine. <laughs> and he calls him dog, which, I mean, he isn't wrong. There's this purpose in a name, you know? Yes. The, the dog's called killer or death or slayer or any of those <laughs> things. It will serve its purpose. <clears throat> and then he calls the dog, dog. And now he shall be a dog. Mm. But if, who proceeds to lick Adam all over the face, which is not what Adam wanted in a dog. <laughs> yeah, and then next we have the great exchange between Aziraphale and Crowley, just Aziraphale shouting at, at him, you said it was him! Well, it was him! <laughs> and then now realising that he can't be the Antichrist, seeing how the Antichrist was delivered, um, a hellhound, which clearly is not what happened here. So they fucking took care of the wrong kid for 11 years. Yes. Which must be really annoying. True. That kid ends up being a real brat. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. Um, so now they talk about that they have to find the actual Antichrist and where it all began, being the the monastery or whatever. Convent? And convent, yes. And now they have to make their way there to try and find the documents and maybe trace the (laughs) end quest. (laughs) This is probably my favorite scene. Yes, it's so good. Um, Well, first we have them on the way there, chatting away in the car, when um, suddenly Crowley hits a woman on a bike. No, she hit him. Well, yes. That's uh, a point of debate in the books. (laughs) She's like, well, oh, I'm broken, oh, I'm broken. And Azira feels like, mm, no, you're not. There you go, up to daisy. <laughs> yes, Azira fell with this slight, tiny miracles. Yeah. And Crowley turns around and goes, she all right? And she, he was like, no, hairline fracture, da 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 da. And everything's fine now. <laughs> oh, it is. And she's like, oh, what about my bike? And he's like, is this your bike? And like, hands over perfectly good bike. And she's like, are you sure this is my bike? <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure it didn't have gears before. Yeah. Or any the scratches from when I bought it. <laughs> and then we have this beautiful line of Crowley who just leans into a Zerophil and says, Oh Lord, heal this bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, as you are using his miracles for a couple of very random things that could not be considered a miracle. <laughs> No, just odd, odd things. <laughs> oh, Lord, heal this bike. <laughs> yes, so, so Lord did heal the bike. He healed it real good. Um, so, Aziraphale, however, finds, I think, finds the book on her, the um, book of the prophecies from Agnes Nutter. The nice and accurate. Yes, prophecies. Um, well, and decide, not a witch. Yeah, and he decides, yoink, mine. Well, that, okay, that is not ha- necessarily how it goes in the audiobook. In the book, she, it gets left in the car, and Crowley just assumes it's Aziraphale's, and, like, hands it off to Aziraphale, being like, you dropped your book. And he was like, oh, no, that's not my book, and I'll, I'll, oh, oh. I'll return it uh, by post. Don't ask about it again. <laughs> yes. Which still means he went, yoink, mine. Yes, I just there was more opportunity and less... Yes, it was not premeditated. I give you yeah. that. Yeah. He's an angel. He couldn't steal it. <laughs> no, no. It's a referral. Only works by the book. <laughs> the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter. That's the book he's working out of. I mean, it's a good choice. So then we have them arriving at the convent, which now is not a convent anymore. As it turns um, out, after the, the nuns had fulfilled their their sole purpose of helping the Antichrist rise, they now were kind of out of a job and needed to make some money. So they decided to swap lanes. 
Yeah, management training? Yes, they went into conference and management training. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. If that's not truly evil, I don't know what is. So, Middle management, kind of like <laughs> hell. <laughs> so Crowley and Desiraphale arrive and like just arrive in the middle of what seems to be a paintball fight, which apparently <laughs> is supposed to do something for team training and all that. Yeah, oh, it was like, you, you can't say that the corporate world is a jungle and then <laughs> hand him in a gun and tell him not to fight. So, anyway, that's one rando middle manager. Oh, <laughs> I enjoy this scene so much. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have them... We have the thing in the middle of that, being slightly confused. And Zero Fell keeps insisting that Crowley must have gotten it wrong and this is not the right place. Yeah. Right up until they run into one of the nuns who now works there. Yeah. But and before that... But before that... Well, so that's like, the... <laughs> yes. Crowley has read out of the mind of the guy that they ran into who shot them with a paintball gun how desperately he wanted a real gun. And so now everybody has a real firearm! <laughs> yes. So as they go that's inside, all of a the sudden gun. they're just real bullets flying through the air. And then Aziraphale's like, oh, you gave them real ammunition! And it's like, oh no, they are all have, like, close calls. They're all sheer luck that they get saved by some guy who get the description is like he goes through his wallet and get he gets saved by his gold mastercard <laughs> box of bullet and then like like they're gonna take out the finance team because the finance <laughs> team was like I didn't think they cut jobs in the literal sense like oh <laughs> it enjoyed the shit out of this scene. It's so dramatic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I also like how blasé they're talking about the whole thing. Like, Crowley going, I don't see why you're so shocked. He wanted a real gun. Every design his head was for a real gun. And Azurus were going, but you've turned him loose on all those unprotected people. Oh no, Crowley said, not exactly. Fair is fair. Yes, so... Um, also, just the line of bullets streaked across the night. <laughs> it's like a beautiful setting of the scene. Down there, it's company law, yes. <laughs> Through mud encrusted features. <laughs> but up here, it's me. <laughs> uh, yes, that was hilarious. Um, so they go inside, they talk to the nun, and they find out that there was, I think, a big fire. Yeah, burned that down destroyed the... everything. <laughs> and immediately, um, Crowley has somebody to blame for that. I can't remember which one it is, but he immediately knows which. He 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 Hester. Hester, yeah. Yeah, it's his style. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> and they're like calling her, and they're, so they're asking her about the other child. And yeah. she just goes, oh, yeah, he had lovely little Tootsie Wootsies. Rosie Woosies, yeah. Uh, fucking nuns, man. Hey, yeah. look, you want to get into the business of birthing things? You're on the same track as these women. No, 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 no. You're not being part of the chattering order? Because you talk <laughs> a lot, too. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I would count as a Satanist. You can be a modern Satanist. They're a little bit different. Yeah, but it would require me to believe in Satan in the first place. Might that's make it hard. The, or, that's not what the current order of Satanism believes in. They believe in community. Uh... And back in the church. <laughs> anyway, continue. This is a completely off topic. As always. But look, I feel like yes. you could really get on board with devil worshipping. It seems more of your style. I don't know, I'm not really a big fan of worshipping anything, you know? It's the whole worshipping part. Alright, well you could just just create chaos. <laughs> I, I could just be a bad Satanist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? Alright, so, we have... <laughs> Moving um, properly Crow along, jeez. <laughs> we have Crowley and Israfel, like going back to London, um, musing 
where are they going to find the Antichrist now? And <laughs> one of my favorite quotes ties in with one of the lines earlier when they were feeding the ducks and just can't remember the exact quote, but it was about things that slide off water and Crowley's just sitting in the car and all of a sudden he's shouting, ducks, what? That's what water slides off. <laughs> <laughs> it's just probably him thinking for days about what does water slide off. <laughs> and yes, the answer, as always, is ducks. It's great. So, yeah. And then next we're jumping back to... Um, we're jumping back to the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter and how Aziraphale is now examining the book in his bookstore, which also, it is a bookstore, but only for the purpose of having of a place books. Yeah, ah. to put all his books and making sure that nobody ever gets to buy one of his books. Yeah, I believe that it's quoted as that he collects books so that nobody else can have them and also... so. He does all the right things by a second-hand bookshop owner to keep people out. Erratic hours, damp, mold, poor lighting. <laughs> yes, yeah. shouting at people. <laughs> He's very good at it. So, we have him examining the book a bit. And then it speaks directly to him, doesn't it? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Hmm. I mean, in the book, it's a really short chapter before we move on to the next thing again. Okay. Well, basically it's jumping back to the horseman of war who is apparently now working as a journalist for National World Weekly in a war zone and um, is now delivered a package in a war zone. <laughs> and it's International Express, I mean. Yeah, they're nailing it. <laughs> it really it really speaks for their quality of, of deliveries, that's for sure. Yeah. I yes. really love the way that they did that in the in the T V show. It just, just helps people. Yes, especially him in like his just standard mailman outfit. Yeah. <laughs> Coming in, oh, delivery here. Oh yeah, right. Everybody wait a moment please while I sign this. Yes. So this delivery is pretty much the hint hint for the horseman to initiate face Armageddon. So I think <laughs> she gets a la <laughs> I think she gets a large sword. Yeah. And has a good look at it and goes, Oh righty then. Uh, sorry to break all this up, but I got some work to do. Been long enough after all. And we Next, we actually, um, yeah, for, I mean, we're like maybe a third through the book and now we actually get the first proper introduction of Adam and his group of friends, which are all slightly strange and weird. I mean, I love the kid with the nerdy, weird parents that named him mm. Pippin Galandriel Moonchild. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, bit hippie it's a Yeah. <laughs> It's it's a tough life. I mean the oh, the other girl is called Pepper, which you know isn't helping either. Hey, they are English. It's all like <laughs> yes. So we have them roaming around, um, playing as kids do, deciding that they're gonna that the new neighbor that moved into town is a witch. Um, yes. So now they decide to play Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> As one does. <laughs> and prepare for witch hunting. I don't think you can go around burning people. It must be illegal. Otherwise, you'd be burning people all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's probably illegal, but I'm not sure. Um, yes, yeah, so they play Spanish Inquisition. One of the kids has to be the witch and needs to be tortured. <laughs> which turns out to be a rather fun event to which the Inquisition decides, okay, torture for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a wholesome affair all around. Yeah, I think we go on to um, Anathema actually realizing that the book is gone. Yeah. Which fuck. And her meeting Adam and his friends who are like, oh my god, you're the witch. In and the 
audiobook that I have, which I'm more, the more comparisons I'm getting, the more I'm feeling that it's almost exactly like the TV show and less like the, the actual book. Yeah, it sounds a bit like it. Yeah, well, I feel misled, so I apologize <laughs> for being, <laughs> like, not as good on this review. Anyway. Um, yeah, so we have Anathema who's inviting Adam in for, like, some lemonade or whatever. The... Yeah, she just made some lemonade. But he <laughs> would he think that lemonade... She's American, right? Yes. Which, so, does he think it's lemonade lemonade, or does he think it's lemon cordial? Or are the British like the Americans in that way? Uh, not really, but... Does he get cordial um, lemonade? I'm really... I need to know. <laughs> anyway, moving on. It's never specified. Oh my god, maybe he gets soda in the end. <sighs> Ew. Yeah, so basically... She talks to him about, you know, witchcraft ain't that bad. <laughs> and yeah. She wouldn't describe herself as a witch. She's more of no. an occultist. <laughs> Yes, which Adam just says, oh, well, that's all right then, I guess. <laughs> Inquisition is only after witches, so good on you. Yeah. He definitely knows what that is. <laughs> yes. And then he, she gives she him gi- a couple of magazines. Yeah, they're just, like, really left-wing, greeny magazines from, like, I don't know when this came out, but, like, the early 90s or something. It's yeah. really anti-nuclear power. <laughs> yes. And, yeah, like, save the oceans and all of that. And he he said, yay. Well, yeah, and my favorite thing was, uh, like, quote from him, it's like, you know, if I could, if I could get rid of nuclear power stations for you, I'd do it. Yeah. Hint, hint, hint. Don't forget your sherbet lemon. (laughs) I don't really understand where they are, but I want one. I mean, pretty much just lemon drops, aren't they? I imagine they're like a hard lolly with sherbet or something on the inside, right? Yeah. I just, I feel like I need to find them. They've been referenced in Harry Potter and now in this. I just, I'm clearly (laughs) missing out on some good lollies and I need to get on board. People, please find us sherbet lemon. (laughs) Although I would very much like to have Dumbledore just offer me some. That'd be much more entertaining, but it's... No, there's... Way too many things have happened if Dumbledore comes back and offers us a sherbet lemon. <laughs> so we got we got a lot of things to be concerned about. <laughs> yes. I just don't have time. I just want a normal person to offer me a sherbet lemon. Anyway, moving on. Yeah. We have a quick intersex- um, interception Interlude? Of, yes. Uh, Aziraphale, who apparently now is reading... The prophecies very intently, and it said that his Coco was stone cold by now, because <laughs> he yes. hasn't hasn't looked up from the book. Also, just the wholesomeness of Aziraphale drinking hot cocoa—it's adorable. Yes, rather than coffee or tea, despite the fact he's very British and very gay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, ah, hold on. What was the quote about? Um, <laughs> there's that great quote about. Aziraphale when he gets introduced about his gayness. <laughs> um, I am many people meeting Aziraphale for the first time from three impressions. That he was English, that he was intelligent, and that he was gayer than a tree full of monkeys and nitrous oxide. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yes, and then we go back to Adam who's like flipping through the magazines and stuff that she gave her. Yeah. And there's also that strange um, part where we have another um, small annotation at the bottom of the page. And it's, on any scale, the mountain moving, it shifted at least 0.5 of an alp. And then we have the little star in John that says, it may be worth noting here that most human beings can rarely raise more than 0.3 of an alp, 30 centi-alps. And it mm-hmm. things on a scale ranging from two through to fifteen thousand six hundred and forty Everests. <laughs> it's just all the nonsense in it. Ah, it's great. Yes, and we have we have like the tidbit about Anathema being really good at reading people's auras. Oh yeah. And being like really confused by Adam's aura. Because she can't see it. Yeah. Then 
we pretty much just have Adam going home, going to sleep, and... Um, his dad getting mad? Yeah. As his dad always seems to be, to be fair. He's mad about the hoses ban or something? Yeah, yeah. I think because of the, the drought or something, they're not allowed to water the garden. Yeah, because it's and not it's... supposed to rain during summer holidays anyway. I mean, it's such a typical British thing. Like... Being super annoyed about the hose man. Uh, that is very British. Yeah, and then we have Adam going to sleep, and then we jump across the country to a nuclear facility where all of the sudden 500 tons of uranium just disappear. Yeah, but they're still producing power. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And just one of the people going, listen, 500 tons of uranium, don't just get up and walk out. Yeah. My favorite bit is like, well, you just have to go in there and have a look. And he's like, what, me? <laughs> yes, you. Uh, yes. So Adam's starting to revolutionize the, <laughs> the oh, nuclear power, power industry. industry. Yes. Yeah. Coming into um, his own with his magical powers. Then we um, go back to horseman number two. Uh, Famine, who is now sitting in a fast food restaurant. Oh, and Chow TM? <laughs> yes. And on like two pages, the words Meals TM and Chow TM has been written about 1500 times. <laughs> it looks ridiculous. Um, but yeah, he's making good money with uh, Burger Lord. <laughs> And they sell food-free food. <laughs> yes. Which is just protein strands strung together with like some kind of cap on the end that prevents, present, prevents your body from digesting them. You think that fat people want to eat food? No. They don't care. Anyway. I mean... Again, the bad they, guys are American. <laughs> yes, and they saw the future. I also like that little bit about the German burger lots who are selling lager instead of root beer. Because <laughs> don't you dare give a German a fatty meal without his beer. Well, truth, right? Yes. I mean, they do sell beer here at McDonald's. So so we have the bit about the, the fast food chain and also a delivery for this horseman. <gasps> Tiny scale! Du, du, du. You should be weighed in the balance. Of this burger to these fries. <laughs> <laughs> so, whop, whop, whop. then we have another scene with Adam and his friends talking about all the crazy stuff he's been reading in the magazines. Yeah. Like UFOs and how the whales are doing bad in the oceans and all this shit. Yeah. Also, and ley lines, lines of power. Yes. Which. Anathema doesn't really seem to believe in, but kind of has to resort to in the end anyway. Yes. So, lots of crazy shit going on. Um, yeah, we go back to Aziraphale, having finally finished reading the, the prophecies. And his tea and his hot cocoa is cold. <laughs> yes, still cold. Still very important <laughs> to mention, apparently. <laughs> and then... I think we get a scene on the news where it's like, well, the, uh, the, the nuclear power plant seemed to have, um, you know, lost its uranium. It's like, yeah, we wouldn't say, we wouldn't say it escaped. It's more like temporarily mislaid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I mean, it's not very some at all. And um, then I think next we actually get the introduction of the Witchfinder. The Witchfinder which, General. Yes. I mean, it's not the... Yeah, it's, it's probably my least favorite character from the books. Yeah, I definitely like him better in the movie. He's a real dick. <laughs> he's yes. a dick in the, in the TV show, too, but... But also, just the way he has his tea... Irks me so. <laughs> oh! <laughs> it doth irk me so. It's like... It's just... It's not okay. It's yeah, not, okay. who, okay, not really a big, like, black tea drinker anyway, prefer green tea, but, like, 
who takes theirs with condensed milk? It it sounds like something that an American would do, you know? Not a British <laughs> person, but an American who decided, oh, let's have some black tea, and then they would just torture it with fucking condensed milk. Mm. Well, I'm not a big fan of iced tea as an ideal either. But, I mean, yeah. it, it depends on the type of tea, I'd say, but I really don't get people who drink, like, proper black tea with milk and then drink it cold. Like, you can't make a fucking iced tea out of that. What's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, <sighs> tea aside. <laughs> yes. So, we get a quick introduction into the, the Witchfinder organization, which is led by our general. And basically, oh, we get a quick... We get a... next to a harlot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is great, because she's definitely not the youngest woman. No. But... Um, well, why does she have a thing for him? He's a douche canoe. I, I think she has some serious damage, just saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we get like a quick... Like a quick rundown of the previous colonels and captains and generals and majors and I don't know why none of this matters. And then we have um, our good old Newton Pulsifer, who is in need of a job. Because he kind of had a job that involved computers and would you believe it, it did not end well. Surprise. Yeah, so he's calling because of um, the Witchfinder's Edward in the papers, which is just join the professionals, part-time assistant required to combat the forces of darkness, uniform basic training provided, field promotion certain, be a man. Pretty good. Look, I'd respond to that. <laughs> I mean, it's concise. And then we have him calling up the Witchfinder channel being, well... Slightly, like, happy about somebody joining the order, because by now he's the only one left by the sound of it. Yeah. I, 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 there's a lot of fake members in this organization. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and, well, I also really like the interview, the phone interview he has with him. <laughs> it's just, what's your name? Newton. Newton Pulsifer. What? Lucifer? <laughs> <laughs> And, and who is it, your hellish master? No, no, Pulsifer. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and I, I don't know. Did you say Newton? Yes, Newton. Uh, is that so? This <laughs> is the weirdest exchange. How many nipples do you have? <laughs> yes, pardon? Nipples, lady, nipples. <laughs> Too good. <laughs> have you got your own scissors? What? Scissors, scissors. Yes, yes, I have some scissors. <laughs> Excellent. So apparently what is really important to combat darkness is that you have two nipples, no more, no less, and scissors. I like it later when he gets equipped and he's like, do you have your bell, book, and pin? Oh, yeah. I don't really understand what I'm doing with the pin. <laughs> and his book is also not a Bible. It's like a children's book. But they had to cut down because of funding. <laughs> it's hard times for the witch order. Uh, okay, and um, yeah, we're back with Aziraphale. And the cocoa has now nearly all solidified. Green fur is growing on the inside of the mug. Ew. There was a thin layer of dust on Aziraphale, too. <laughs> so apparently he's been sitting there for quite a bit. Um... Yeah, so he's still trying to find that one part of the pro uh, prophecies that he's trying to get to. Um, okay, so next we have um, Newt being introduced into the Witchfinder organization. Yeah, he's getting all dolled up for his big adventure. <laughs> yes, and basically being presented with his book that, yes, is not a Bible. <laughs> Bell and pin. Oh, book, bell, and candle. It's book, bell, and candle so that you can do exorcisms. Come on, you're a Supernatural fan. You should have remembered this. 
not exactly how it happens in Supernatural, but sure. Um, so he's being um, mute using his scissors very expertly, mm -hmm. cutting out uh, weird news articles from the papers and finding that there's a lot of strange occurrences happening around Tedfield. So, so the together. yeah. So the sergeant says, off you go to Tedfield, laddie. <laughs> Or something of the sort. Mm -hmm. And off he goes. I think then we get the um, express delivery for the next the next horseman, which I think is pollution now. And <laughs> just yeah. And then I think he he writes a like a little love note to his wife, the delivery man. Um, to yeah, then deliver right. the last to package ahead. to death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just like the delivery man being really fucking terrified and just, you know, it's a delivery for you, sir, for me. Yes, it's a message, deliver it then. <laughs> and the message is just come and see. And that was like, finally, thank you. I must commend you on your devotion to duty. And then, then we actually have the the awesome line of, you know, uh, am I going to die now? Don't think of it as dying. Just think of it as leaving early to avoid the rush. And yes, then we have Sergeant Shedwell, our good old Witchfinder Sergeant, who's, um, I think, like checking all of his equipment. And yes, here we actually have it. Are you ready? Do you have... All your supplies, uh, yes. Mm. The pendul the pendulum of discovery, yes. Mm. The, the thumb screws, uh, yes. Mm. Fire lighters, I really think Sergeant that fire lighters, yes. And fire lighters yes, and no, matches. Matches. Mm. <laughs> Bell, book, and candle. And then, um, <laughs> like he grabs the the small bell, and the book called Prayers for Little Hands. <laughs> 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 and then. He goes, yes, I have spell book and kettle. How about pin? Pin? Good lad, never forget your pin. Wait, it's the pin. bayonet. Yeah, it's the bayonet in your artillery. <laughs> and he's, he goes, like, I wish I could go with you on this great, uh, great adventure, but alas, I cannot. And yes, sits back down on his fat bottom and sends Newt off to do the exciting things. Yes, but my favorite thing about the pin is like, uh, why, why do I need the pin? And he's like, to, so you can get the witch, so you can identify the witch. And then he's like, well, the statistics on it say that like, eighty percent of women said it hurt, twenty percent of women said like, I oh, couldn't feel it, and one witch reported that it cured her arthritis. <laughs> I'm actually not sure that that's in the books. Oh. Um, but it might be just at a different um, at a different part. Yes, so we have Newt going off on his adventure. Then I think we have Anathema trying to trying to find the ley lines, mm. which she still doesn't believe in really, but doesn't really know what else to do at this point. Then we have Newt like asking people from the newspaper articles stuff. Like somebody who saw a UFO. <laughs> he's like, so I, I saw your article. You you saw something funny? <laughs> Just uh, not the best idea. And then we actually have him running into people with a UFO. So as he's oh, driving man. along the road, there's a UFO just landing on the field next to him. And he's like stopping and pulling down the window. And he's like slightly being uh, terrified by the fact that there are actual aliens coming out of it and just walking up to him. <laughs> and they're just like, is this your planet, sir? And it's like, well, yes, I suppose so. Mm. Headed long, have we, sir? Uh, not personally, I mean, as a species, like half a million years, I think. <laughs> and the alien just going up and letting the old acid rain build up, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> letting ourselves go a bit on the old hydrocarbons, perhaps. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and, yes, 
yeah, just basically, <laughs> uh, we've been asked to give you a message. Oh, really? Well, what's the message? We give you a message of universal peace and cosmic harmony and such a like. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, oh, okay. Well, that's very kind. Well, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> and then just the aliens like kind of, mm, yeah, well, okay, I think that's, that's it then. So we, we should go. Yeah, we should go. So Adam decided to make sure that the aliens and the UFOs gave everyone some peace. <laughs> Very thoughtful, really. I think that's Pepper's idea more than anything. Yeah. And we do have another scene between Adam and his friends talking about the weird, weird shit in those fucking magazines. <laughs> They're so weird. <laughs> yeah. Then we have um, Anathema actually meeting Newt now, who made it to Tedfield. Finally. <laughs> Which I think happens because there's a huge hole opening up on the road in front of Newt's mm. cars, uh, car, and it's just people who have been digging their way oh, from... Oh, mole people, people digging from China, that's right. Yes. Yes, I mean, not at all strange. And yeah, those two meet, and that's about introducing herself as an occultist. And it's just a hobby. I'm really a witch. Well done. Good job as a witch finder. I mean, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and Newt basically having his first, I think, feeling of success in his entire life of, holy shit, I found a witch. I'm the best at this. <laughs> yeah. And... Then I think that's when we get introduced to the um, to the cards, right? The um, the prophecy, like the prophecy translations that they did on note cards or something. Oh yeah, the flashcards. Yeah, and he's like, you know, oh, she, I, I knew that you would be coming, basically. And he's like, how did you know that? And then he, she shows him the the card that is about him, where it's just yeah. Ren Orient's chariot. Inverted B and then Japanese car. <laughs> Four wheels in the sky. Upturned. Car smash. <laughs> <laughs> and just, yeah. Injuries and man who testeth with a pin. <laughs> yeah, which one? Pins. Good. <laughs> And yes, basically all very complicated, but clearly leading to the Witchfinder in his Japanese car. <laughs> yes, because apparently all of the um, all of the descendants of Agnes Nutter had to deal with translating all of her prophecies in a way that makes sense to modern day happenings. And I really love one of those prophecies that just says, "Go put all your money into in, into an apple." <laughs> Which just means that the family bought so many stocks in Apple yeah. and made a lot of money with it. So they're doing pretty well. Yes. I mean, it's always good. We get a bit more back and forth between those two. And I think we I also mean, see... flirting. Yes, which he's terrible at, but yeah. it doesn't matter. Because it's prophesized, so. She's already accepted her fate. <laughs> yes, which sounds very sad. Like, <laughs> don't want this, but fine. Yes, we have more of Adam and his friends, like, planning how they should redo the world if they could redo it better than it is. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Yeah, and then we have a couple more of the translated um like prophecies uh the one that talks about the aliens um <laughs> then just a weird one that they couldn't figure out that has something to do with bismarck and maybe schleswig holstein that's <laughs> just <laughs> fucking weird yeah somewhere they clearly got some shit wrong it's just a mix of amsterdam and then it's Tartsfield. <laughs> And then it's Tedfield. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> then we have another one um, with the Horsemen of the Apocalypse who will be rising. And then also another part that nobody could translate. So one of the device ancestors just wrote on a feel good actor's head drunk well that night. <laughs> <laughs> and the next we're just saying, I concur, we are all human, alas. <laughs> And yes, so they talk about the prophecies for a bit. And then it starts to hail like crazy shit. And they're like bullet sized ice pieces, basically. It's, yeah, it's very strange occurrence. Yeah. I think next we have the horsemen actually meeting up and. The gang all get together. Yeah. All with their motorbikes because they're the cool horsemen. So cool. <laughs> and. At some stage, we also get to talk about Agnes from her standpoint of view back in the day. Next, we have Shadwell meeting his neighbor, the Jezebel, the painted Jezebel. The painted Jezebel, the harlot next door. (laughs) Which, I mean, she's really sweet. She, like, brings some food and everything. Yeah, she doesn't work on Thursday nights. (laughs) Yes, she takes care of him, even though he calls her the painted Jezebel. Yeah, I think she likes it. <laughs> yeah, she's somehow into it, but... Ah. Yeah. Well, if Everyone you've got a shaping it. fetish, it's fine. <laughs> yes, then we go back to Crowley and Israfel, and Crowley just basically storming in on Israfel, telling him he's located... <laughs> he's found the Antichrist, and... Well, where is he? Well, he's at a place called Lower Tedfield. <laughs> mm. And we now have a bit of a discussion about what should we do about this. And I think Aziraphale is is then talking to Metatron. Oh yeah. Which is which is greatly described as the voice of God, but not the voice of God. <laughs> An entity in its own right, rather like the presidential spokesman. <laughs> Which I think is a nice explanation for it. Um, yes, where he basically just goes, mm, yeah, yeah, it's all going great. You're right, apocalypse. Nice, excellent. So on board with this. And then we pretty much have Aziraphale and Crowley go, yeah, no, we have to do something about this. Um... We get a bit more of Shadwell, and he actually shows up at Aziraphale's, I think. I'm not sure why anymore, though. Uh, Shadwell and Aziraphale talk because Aziraphale dies. Yeah, but um, I can't remember why Shadwell actually turned up at his shop in the first place. Well, Does he call and, him and uh, ask him to come round? Maybe. Well... At any rate, we have Shadwell at Israfil's place, who, like, places a candle there, <laughs> very dramatically. And then, as Israfil talks to Metatron, he actually ends up disappearing through a blue glow, which gives um, Shadwell the great feeling of accomplishment, because he now just destroyed a demon. A demon. Yeah. <laughs> With a fucking candle, because, yeah, yeah, that's how you do that. <laughs> Next, we get another great passage of Crowley, where um, he's at his home and has the most incredible green plants in his apartment. Oh, that's because right. at some point in the 70s, he wrote something about talking to plants, but mm-hmm. he doesn't really talk to them, as in he shouts at them. And once a month, he takes one of the pots that hasn't been growing fast enough and throws it out as a warning <laughs> to the others. He just couldn't cut it. So basically, all the plants in his apartment were the most luxurious, verdant, and beautiful in all of London, but also the most terrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, I like the idea of terrifying a plant into growing. That's just, it's great. And then we actually have, I'm not sure if it's Hester again this time, but we have one of the demons going, getting into contact with Crowley, pretty much going, what the hell is going on? Because 
they grab the the warlock boy <laughs> and uh, he who apparently doesn't have a dog with him which is strange mm-hmm. and we're planning to take him to the place that is prophesized to be the place of the apocalypse but now it turns out the dog has no fucking idea about anything and he's not our master what's going on and Crowley basically just goes ah hmm. yes and it's pretty much knee deep in shit now so now everyone knows that there's some that something just went horribly wrong in the plan and Crowley has to escape quickly now Is dying over there? Uh, it's crying children outside. Mm. Crowley goes, when after he gets out of trouble, he pretty much goes straight to Aziraphale's, doesn't he? Yes. I mean, he also burns the the other demon with uh, holy water. Oh, yes, that he'd been trying to convince Aziraphale to get for him for ages. Yes, which he kept in a thermos flask. Mm. So he's using like two pairs of heavy PVC gloves <laughs> and tongs <laughs> to put it in a bucket and put that bucket above the door. It's very booty <laughs> trap. But oh. yes, it's enough for him to to escape, basically. Yeah. Um, he escapes through the telephone as well, which, you know, isn't strange at all. That's pretty um, cool. Yeah. And then he calls um, Aziraphale, or tries to call him. He doesn't answer. No. Very unhelpful. Um, and then he drives there, right? Um, yeah. Alright, he just, he drives (laughs) everywhere. (laughs) Pretty much trying to find Aziraphale. We then have another little back and forth between Madam Tracy and (laughs) Shedwell. Yeah, and of just cooking Brussels sprouts, apparently. <laughs> then we have Crowley showing up at the bookshop. And just Crowley shouting for Aziraphale and just going, Aziraphale, for God, mm. <laughs> for, some, for somebody's sake. <laughs> and just manages to set the bookshop on fire. Yeah, he gets the book, though, doesn't he? He makes sure he has uh, Agnes Nutter's book. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, um, then he just flees the crime scene, basically. He's now an arsonist. Yeah. Um, my favourite bit after this is that he's, his conclusions could be summarised as follows. One, Armageddon was on the way. Two, there was nothing Crowley could do about it. Three, it was going to happen in Tadfield, or to begin there at any rate. After that, after it was going to happen everywhere... Crowley yes. was now in Hell's bad books, not that Hell had any other kind of books. And Aziraphale was, as far as could be estimated, was out of the equation. All the black, gloomy, awful stuff, there was no light at the end of the tunnel, and there was an oncoming train. Might as well find a nice restaurant, get completely and utterly passed out of his mind, sorry, pissed out of his mind, and wait for the world to end. And yet... <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the apocalypse comes, that's just... Best as you can do, I'd say. Just get fucking drunk. Mm. Yeah. We have another another tiny back and forth between Adam and his friends before we get another look into the uh, horsemen on their way to Tatfield. <laughs> Where they just have Hell's Angels <laughs> written on their jacket. <laughs> and just oh, This is a where guy. somebody asks them what chapter they're in, right? Yeah, no, just a, um, a guy called Big Ted. Sarc- uh, sarcastically calls them your hell's angels <laughs> what chapter are you from then <laughs> and I think it's death who just goes revelations chapter 6 <laughs> verse 2 to 8 and how long do you think they held on to that joke like it's probably one of the first things they wrote down <laughs> as a add in later and, and Big Ted just going Jesus Christ and one of the other guys going, I think he may be along in a minute. <laughs> I think he's probably some, uh, somewhere looking to park his bike. Uh, yes, and then 
Yeah, we have a bit about quite... Marvin. Don't we um, also have the... So there are two demons that come for Crowley, right? And then one of them gets burned with the holy water, and the other one gets trapped in the phone? Yeah, I think so. I'm not and sure then... if it was more on the TV show, but I think so, no, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's in the book as well. So then there's the great misfortune of uh, getting an automatic... Like an auto dial call from some <laughs> yes. and then the oh, eight hundred cash. <laughs> yeah, and poor telemarketer frees the uh, demon from the phone, and then all these worms start appearing or something. <laughs> yes, which I mean, telemarketing. Not gonna lie, they might deserve that. <clears throat> no single person does a job's a job, I guess, but like the concept, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we get some more threatening Crowley with you gotta you gotta do your shit man, we gotta win this war. It's important. And Crowley pretty much not giving a shit. Yeah. Now he's decided to become an optimist. He's headed to Tadfield. <laughs> Cause might as well. Um, is this where we find out that Aziraphale's managed to come back in the body of, um, the Jezebel. <laughs> My, Madam Tracy. Yeah. I think, um, I think we have a conversation between them first, where Aziraphale is, like, without a body at the moment. Yeah. Like, I, I need, just, uh... Like, I'm, I'm out of a body at the moment, <laughs> which might be an issue down the line. And, yeah, Crowley, I think, pretty much just telling him, get a fucking body, we have things to do. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, yes. I mean, seeing how gay and flamboyant he is all the time, it is very Mm. fitting that he's now in Madame Tracy's body. (laughs) Yeah. He is so flamboyant. (laughs) Yes. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Of course you think so. Um, yes. So, we have Aziraphale taking over Madam Tracy, really. Uh, he asked her permission first. Yes, no, he was polite about it. <laughs> and we have Crowley trying to get on his way, but that ain't that easy. Yeah, no, he gets trapped on the greatest, his greatest achievement. <laughs> yes, the M25. Which I still think is something we should change in all of the um, navigational apps and programs of just whenever it's about the M25, somebody going, and now turn right onto Crowley's M25. The signal si- signal of the demons of hell or whatever he, whatever it is. Yes. And I'm pretty sure at some stage the motorway also catches fire. <laughs> Which, oh, yeah, that's right. Because now it's a huge burning ring. A general <laughs> ring of fire. Ring of fire. <laughs> so we have right. multiple chapters of him trying to make his way over various devilish motorways. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have everyone trying to make their way to Tedfield. And we have Adam turning slightly strange now. He's, I mean, it's kind of like he's drunk on power in a way. I kind of think forgot to mention at the, like we did have this, this hilarious scene in the book with the four horsemen and their Hell's Angels jacket and the talk, oh, about, yeah. talk with the big Ted guy and everything. But yeah. they actually, but the other group of bikers actually joined them for part yeah. of the part so, of the journey and they get great names too. <laughs> yeah. Voicemail and um what uh, vo- there's, um, there's voicemail and cool people and Hold on, I have the I have the list somewhere here. Oh there. Yes. We have grievous bodily harm. <laughs> we have uh, really cool people, cruelty to animals and embarrassing personal problems. <laughs> <laughs> no alcohol lager. <laughs> Things not working properly, even after you've given them a really good thumping. Yeah. 
and all foreigners, especially the French. <laughs> but like the thing about this is that like they're changing their own names. There are there are four of them, but they all have like multiple names. <laughs> yes, because if you're in a real cool biker gang, that's what you do. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like Pighead or whatever one of them is actually called. It's a bit of a cool, <laughs> cool name for a biker dude. I mean, if you already have a bike, does it really count if you don't have a cool name to go with it? No, doesn't count. I've asked my friends who have motorbikes. <laughs> you mean you're a cool pig? Yeah. Excellent. My friend Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he definitely needs a cool biker name. You can never go, hey, Leslie, is that you on that bike? It's uh, fine. Definitely, he, he, he needed a new name, so it's fine. Um, yes, and then just after that great phone escape of Crowley's... Oh my god, the phone escape is great. I just, I enjoy that scene all over again. It is hilarious. And just afterwards we also have this great kind of strange passage about the very important old-time question of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? <laughs> None, I believe, is the answer, right? I mean, yes, but we get into the fact that Aziraphale is the only angel that actually can dance because he learned to dance the gavotte in the <laughs> 1880s. And it took him, like, quite some time to master the style, and he was very proud until just a couple of years later the whole thing just fell apart and became mm-hmm. super unpopular forever. <laughs> and he was very cross about that. Yeah, I can, I can see that. And not to mention that, actually, if we also ask how many demons could do that, seeing how they're not bound to their physical form as much, a lot of them could actually <laughs> dance on the pin of a head. This becomes like a whole a long pin. explanation. Yeah. So then we do have, um, we do finally get to the point where Aziraphale finds out, or is figuring out, that it's Tadpole where the shit is going to go down. And... He's a bit you of a bum Tad because... Beals? Did you just call it Tadpole? Oh, fuck, it's Tadfield. <laughs> ah, it's I'm specifically a lower Tadfield if we're going to get real dramatic. Yes, true, but then... <laughs> Only um, that really nosy neighbor guy cares about the difference between upper and lower, or Tadfield and lower Tadfield. Yeah, he's also the kind of person who would probably call if the sign is wrong. Um, he does. He Well, he writes a letter. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we have Aziraphale debating for a bit whom he should tell, if he should tell anybody, because this, like, what am I going to do? And in the end, he does He does call Metatron, God. I think. And well, he tries to call God, but... Uh, yeah. But God is way too God busy to answer the phone himself. Like, really? He should well, just go call enough. God, right? He's got the ineffable plan, or whatever it is. Yeah. Like sitting on the ine- Like him sitting on the ineffable couch. <laughs> Drinking an ineffable beer? Yes. That, um, come on. Let's face it. Turns out God is German. Um, <laughs> How fucking terrible would that be in the end? Yeah. Uh, yes. I don't know. It depends what generation of German. <laughs> Um, I mean, if he's a recent one, then we just get a, a relatively old man sitting on the couch drinking beer. That one oh I can God. get on. We'd have it's to watch football like for dead. eternity. Yeah. Fucking hell. Yes. So coming back from the German God, <laughs> we also have our good old chief witchfinder. Oh, finding yeah. Finding Israel in his shop, listening to, to the conversation with Metatron and deciding, this is definitely a demon possession right here, and this is my shit. Stay in your lane, mate. You're about <laughs> witches, not demons. Don't give us none of this bullshit. Yeah. So. Not mad about it. Not mad about <laughs> it. So Israel is losing his... Um, his body, effectively. Formal form! Yes. And the Witchfinder, of course, thinks he fucking banished a demon, which was the first finger. time ever. And she proceeds yes. to not wash. Ugh. Finger guns. Clear 
really he's the best and the biggest of everyone now. Yeah. I think he does make a reference to it that none of the other witchfinders have ever managed to banish a demon. <laughs> yes, which would make him the first successful person at his job in forever. Yeah. Well, look, I don't have high respect for any of the witchfinders of the since Pulsifer. Yeah, that's true. And then we <laughs> We get the great scenes of Aziraphale now roaming around, just possessing people's bodies at random, trying to find his way back to America. And oh, yeah, on to... the radio. <laughs> yes, and just eventually hoping to make his way back to so, London or Tedfield. Somewhere a little closer, I believe, is the phrase. Yes, and the great thing is the first person he ends up in is... <laughs> like a... A it's preacher? a pastor, yeah, who, who does who does Christian songs, and just the list of the songs he has written is great on itself. Just we have Happy Mr. Jesus, Jesus, mm-hmm. can I come and stay at your place? That old fiery cross, Jesus is the sticker on the bumper of my soul. Ah, uh, it's just, it's great. I mean, they're all from his album Jesus is My Body, which just sounds like such enjoyable music. Such enjoyable music. And the fact that Crowley is listening to that song, that station to try and calm down. <laughs> found that pretty entertaining. I don't know if that's actually in the book. No? Mm, no. Because we have, well, yeah, we have Aziraphale basically stuck in him. Um, and he's right now on television giving an interview about his music and stuff. And then he just goes on a really long rant about how um, do you? Why do you think there would be a rapture? Do you really think that we have nothing better to do than sit around in heaven and then pull up people at random so you can be sitting up yeah. there and look at the other guys? Ha ha! You stayed behind and all that stuff. Yeah, he's like, we just don't have time for that. So in the in the version that I've got, um, which okay, so I don't think it's the audiobook. Now I think it is the dramatized audiobook. Um, Clearly, a hundred percent. What the problem is. Uh, but he's on the radio that cr- as Crowley's listening to it, so that um, Crowley hears him, and then they're like, he's like, okay, he's making his way back, everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> yeah, in the book he just yeah he goes on that long explanation, and then he just goes, oh, I'm, I'm in America, aren't I? <laughs> and just oh god, am I on television? And then he just disappears. <laughs> and yeah, next we have Crowley making his way down with Queen the, as the amazing soundtrack in the background. Down his greatest achievement. Yes. And I also love that in the book they actually had to, like in the front where it's all about the copyrights, they had to write down the um, that they're using the lyrics from Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> because they actually quoted so much in the books that they have to make it clear they do not own the rights for the song. Which I think somebody was going through a phase. <laughs> Possibly, but then it's a good one. <laughs> okay, next we have, um, next we're jumping back to Madam Tracy, who is now holding her seance with some of her clients, which is really just, it's hilarious. She is, um, she's sitting there with some people who are trying to connect to her old, um, her old husband, Ron, who died. Oh, yeah. And it's just got no time for her shit either. Like you wouldn't let me put in a word in Edgewise. Sorry, sorry. Keep going. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. So basically, me. I'm the wife. (laughs) Yes. And then we have (laughs) we have Azuriel jumping into Madam Tracy's body, (laughs) and he has no idea where he is or what's going on. So he just starts in multiple languages asking what language they're speaking to find out where he even is. He starts in Which German, is, right? Um, there is German as well, yeah. German, French, something I assume is either Chinese or Japanese. No, it should be Chinese, I think. Um, not that I could pronounce it in any way. And then just the woman going, is that you, Ron? Like, he just asked in multiple different languages. I don't think this is going to be Ron. Yeah. Is Ron <laughs> and him just going... <laughs> Yeah, I, I doubt it. 
And we just have him, no, no, definitely not Ron. Definitely not Ron. But there is a spirit here who seems to be responding to that. I'll put him, I'll put him on for you. <laughs> oh, Ron has got uh, no time for her shit either. Yeah. He's also, like, you gotta have, you have to gonna be quick about this because this is about the apocalypse. So could you wrap it up with Ron? Yeah. And he's, uh, so she goes to like give him the rundown of their m- mundane little lives, and he goes, no, no. I didn't, you didn't get, let me get a word in edgewise when I was alive. Now you're going to harass me when I'm dead. <laughs> Shut up! And then as the girl comes back on, he's like, very happy. <laughs> he's crossing over now. Especially going, one, well, remember your heart condition. And yeah. he's like, and yeah, I duh, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> I'm fucking dead. <laughs> like, I don't know why she was so very in need of talking to her dead husband about his heart condition. No, she didn't want to talk to her dead husband. She just wanted to talk. And this is an excuse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Azurafil basically just going, wasn't that touching? Okay, now. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, so you're about the session of our favorite harlot. Yes, and... We jump back and forth a bit now between them and <laughs> funny occurrences on the M6, where, for example, fish are just falling out of the sky. Yes. Causing a lorry to be upturned, I believe. Yes. Get it on a stingray or a shark or something? <laughs> um, I think it was a lobster. No, there's a lobster in the policeman's pants who keep, like, <laughs> oh, yes. holding onto the policeman's pants. It's just, it's fish all around. It's great. Um, and then we're jumping back to Ted Field where Newt is succeeding with his, let's say, great skills at flirting. And he and Anathema are getting it on. That has nothing to do with his flirting and more so that it's no. specifically written down on her to-do list. Yes. But he can tell himself for the moment that that's why it happened. And I'm sure it's a great confidence yeah. boost my favorite thing is we could do it again and she goes no we can't and he goes what what and she's like it's written down in the prophecies and he was like no no and then she like hands him the prophecy and he's like i don't i don't really like i don't really like this and i don't, I don't like the snotty comments your ancestors have written in the margins <laughs> we get that we also get little snippets about Adam talking about how they can shape the whole world now the way they want it to be and getting a little bit more bonkers. Yeah. I how like hungry, the... kind of. Well, I don't know. So he's he, clearly he's got voices going on in his head, but his mm. friends are really sensible, like really down to earth in that, like, it's all well and good to play pretend, but like there are real life consequences if we got rid of all of these other people. Like, yeah, I mean, in the end, they're the ones who are like, well, if you're going to do that shit, we're just going to play somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, ah, okay, sorry, then we'll not do that. Like, the apocalypse in the end was averted by kids going, nah, maybe not. Yeah, kids who pretty much up until that point had followed him anywhere and everywhere with whatever ID he had. Yeah, I mean, there's posse. Yeah. So then we get another cute conversation between Israfel and Madame Tracy where she agrees to Bloody Harlot <laughs> Yes Jezebel um, Sorry. Yes, basically agreeing fine you can you can use my body. It's it's the apocalypse. Let's let's not fight about this. And Shadwell being really confused and just what the hell is going on. Yeah. Um yes. I love the whole scene of quickly though. Yeah. I mean, he shows her everything that she needs to know to, like, Not to know he's telling the Madam truth. Not Madam Tracy. The, I, like, I don't have an issue with Madam Tracy coming on board with the plan. It's Sergeant Shadwell that's fine with the pos- the possessed harlot driving him to Tadfield. <laughs> True. I mean, I think that's probably the first inkling we get that he does like the harlot. Yeah, and he's not just yelling at her. He left... <laughs> I mean, yeah, all right. 
I mean, she feeds him every Sunday. Every Sunday. And does the yes. washing up. He, like, <laughs> yes. give her a plate back. Uh, while, while he's also insulting her as he takes the damn food. Look, I'm, she's got a shaming kink. She loves it. Yes, definitely. Uh, okay, so we have all of that. We um, go back to Crowley, who is now trying to get past the roadblock on his way. And also there is fire now. Things and cars have caught on fire. So he kind of holds on to the Book of Prophecies because that's the important thing right now and just goes through the fire. Like, this is fine. This is important. It'll be fine. Yeah. The Bentley's on fire, though. And he's on yes. fire. My favorite is the police report part of it. He's like, there's a man, on, there's a Bentley trying to cross the M... What is it again? M25? The M40, I think, at this stage. And he's, but it's on fire. Yeah, so is he, so is the car. And he's like, what in the car? And he's like, and he's wearing a mad grin. <laughs> yes, and just, I I love the opening of that, of that particular chapter. Where it's just, look at Crowley doing 110 miles per hour on the M40 heading toward Oxfordshire. <laughs> Even the most resolutely casual observer would notice a number of strange things about him. The clenched teeth. The dull red glow coming from behind his sunglasses. And the car. The car was definitely a hint. (laughs) Yes, so we have him pretty much sacrificing his beautiful, much-beloved car. The Bentley I wanted. Yes, and we have Madame Tracy together with Aziraphale (laughs) and Chadwell on a little... I mean, it's not a motorbike, it's more like a... Yes. Going at, well, let's call it a rather small speed. <laughs> is there a fellow slightly complaining? Um, yes, and I then, believe it, it, it. Top speed it does when it's just her on it is like 17 miles per hour. But with the <laughs> two of them on it, it's more like four. <laughs> yes, and is there a fellow is just calculating that it would take them about five hours at this speed to get there, which is not acceptable. Oh, I had uh, the audiobook says 12. Oh, okay. So we basically have him doing this Another bit of miracle here. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it seems like the car, uh, the bike is much more closer to the speed of light now, <laughs> which isn't strange at all. Yeah. Not even a little bit. It's Everything is perfectly fine. I still enjoy the police report of the flying Vespa, though. Or yes. moped, I think, is the word that they use. Mm, yeah, that would fit better. Yeah, we have everyone now in Tetfield moving towards the um, the airfield there. We have Newton. Sorry, before um, we get to that point, we just talk about what happens to the, the other held angels. Oh, yeah. So the, the angels of hell, the four horsemen, have picked up the our friend's voicemail and whoever else they are um driving down the satanic highway out towards tadfield and they proceed to fly over the top of an upturned lorry that had been that had hit the fish yes. and um death decides to slow down a little and they're like what and he's like oh no no, no i'll catch up and behind them ride our four secondary horsemen of the not quite apocalypse, <laughs> and um, they're like anything that they can do, we can do too. And proceed instead of flying over the lorry on their super cool motorbikes, they just crash straight into it and end up dying. Whoops! <laughs> Whoops! It is. And death just going, oh for fuck's sake! You never can take a day off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's life. Death, in fact. Yes. And. Then we have Newt and Anathema deciding that this right here must mean the airfield, where apparently they have like some kind of weaponry system in place. No, they don't have any weapons there, but they have computers, which can talk to other weapons. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's all very conveniently not described in the books. 
It's like whenever there's there's a point where clearly they didn't want to invest a lot of backstory. It's just like, mm, yeah, and things. <laughs> Moving on. But done hilariously so. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and we also have Adam and his posse deciding to move to the airfield now, where we <laughs> have a strange scene between him and uh, Adam and his dad, just like, uh, we're going to the uh, base? Oh, okay. Good. Yay. Um, the dad's not involved in the audiobook. Um, oh. No, they have an interaction with their favorite neighbor. Oh. And he is like, I'm going to tell your dad about this. And he's like, all right, go ahead. And and he's like, and you're on ladylike manners. She's like, oh. <laughs> Pepper's like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> Definitely not. Patriarchal like bullshit that. and dog, the useless piece of fluff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she ain't taking shit from anybody. So we also have Crowley arriving at the at the airfield now, around the same time as Aziraphale does, because he's just moving at the speed of light, so there's no no issue of a time delay here. I mean, there's a small moment. Yeah. A jippy, if you would. <laughs> yes, and just their meeting is great. <laughs> just basically Madam Tracy in a voice that isn't hers starting to talk to Crowley, and then, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Crowley, this is Madam Tracy. Madam Tracy, this is Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yes. Something, some, say something along the lines of, oh, this body, new body suits you or something as well? The, the dress. You look lovely in the dress. <laughs> and him actually going, wait, thank you. <laughs> yes. We have Newt and Anathema breaking into the, well, into the airfield. I w- yeah, I want to know how this goes down in the book because this is done really well in the audiobook. So in the audiobook that I have, it um, it, Newt uh, shows up with his Witchfinder ID because it's got a military rank on it and he's like, I need to get into the base. And he's like distracting the guy and then Anathema climbs up behind him and like he, the guard feels something press up against his back and she's like, I need you to drop your weapon. And he's like, oh! Okay, and he drops it, and then he's like, now I'm going to drop my stick and pick up your weapon. (laughs) I'm not actually sure if it was exactly like that in the book, but I think so. On that one, I'm actually not sure, I have to say. I was enjoying enjoying that, and then she's like, ooh, handcuffs! And he's like, wait, wait, wait! (laughs) Yes. And uh, which one of these buildings uh, has the radio equipment in it, or, or radio and computing equipment in it? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you! And she's like, I believe we have your gun now. And he's like, the one with all the satellites or something. Or the antennas. <laughs> yes, very helpful. Apparently there is only one building with antennas. Because this book is a little bit old. <laughs> yeah. We have them in the end standing around and just going, nah, what are we doing now? And she's like, well, we, we, we got we to gotta do something. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to, like, how to help us. And then he just breaks down with, um, I have to be honest, I'm really bad with computers. I, I, I don't know how to fix this and help us. Because whenever I touch any computer, they just break down. She's like, mm, okay, that works. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And she's like, well, just just fix it. What? Just just fix the computers. <laughs> Until he sets to work to fix this right up, and as predicted, <laughs> he does very greatly in it. Yeah. We then also have the today in this story. Yes, it's great. Um, we have the the horsemen arrive then together with Adam, and having a, a strange conversation where Adam just goes with. Nah, I don't think I want to do Apocalypse today. And they're just like, well, but if you're, you're like, your very existence mean that the world has to end, it is written, and Adam's just like, mm, I don't feel like it. <laughs> nah, maybe next week, like, today's really bad for me. <laughs> and it's just so great, because death is just like, but you, you can't, like... This has been written thousands of years ago. There's a plan. The inevitable plan. And Adam's just having none of that shit. 
Um, um, and that's it. Pep, Pepper be, become Pepper has a stick instead of a sword and all that, or is that yes. just an audiobook? No, she has two bits of wood and a piece of <laughs> string. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and she just—I mean, she, I think Adam goes uh, going just uh, go get them, and then she just goes forward with um, with the, like two pieces of stick and a string and going, I see. Mano e mano, eh? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, basically, Adam gets to, like, I think he, he just repeats the words, don't touch them. Mm. And somehow that's, like, the magic will that he's... Well, they have to take his orders, right? Yeah. So... Then the the horsemen, like all all except Death, are just starting to turn around and make their way back somewhere with great haste. And I th- yeah, I think one of the kids is like, where they go? And Death just, oh, I know, they were back back to doing what they've always done. It's fine. And at some stage, we like crowd into zero fell just like, well. Look at that, we didn't even need to do anything to him. Mm. He was already not going to do the apocalypse. Nice. Like, he was good all along. Yay. And then we have uh, Metatron showing up, which I don't I can't remember if that was in the TV show as well or not. Um, I think we had they Gabriel went, and... Yeah, um, which they yeah. made up, so... Yeah, well, like I think that... Yeah, I think it was hard to, like, identify... Here we have the Archangel where we can deal with rather than, like, introducing a new character that nobody knows or nobody's heard of for a while. Yeah. So we have Metatron showing up, and we also have Satan himself showing up, although he's just named as Beelzebub. Beelzebub, yeah, the demon. And a lot of, well, Adam, you you know, you you got to do shit. <laughs> we can't just cancel the apocalypse. This has been in the calendar for a really long time. And he's just like, nah. And nah. And there are a couple of really nice quotes from Adam. Like, the whole thing of, I don't see what's the what's so terrific about creating people as people and then getting upset because they act like people. <laughs> and the whole... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, if you stop telling people it's all sorted out after they're dead, they might try sorting it all out while they're still alive. (laughs) Possibly, yeah. Yeah, so very deep, you know, very deep here, Adam. So he just basically insists, I I don't care if it's written and ineffable plan and all of that, Um, like, nah, I'm not into apocalypse, so I'm I'm cancelling this shit. And I think it's less of a of a drama like in the TV show. I mean, they did have to make it more interesting, I suppose. Raise the stakes a little bit. Yeah, but in the book, it's pretty much just, nope, not gonna have this. And everybody's like, but you got to. And it's like, no. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, guess we can't force you to do apocalypse. So. We can't force sucks. you to apocalypse. <laughs> yes. We you don't get a visit from, from the dad. Like in the TV show? <laughs> no, we actually don't. We have um, we have Metatron and Bells about just disappearing again, accepting defeat at some stage, and Adam yeah. deciding to trying to fix up a couple of weird things. Yeah. Or basically trying to turn things back to the way they used to be, somewhat. Yeah, trying to return it all to normal. We have Crowley's car going back to functional, which is Yay! very nice. Yay! Excitement all around. And we have everybody just going, well, this this has been a good day all around. Yeah, it actually has been. Yeah. And Crowley and Desiree just... like the cutesy couple they are, deciding, <laughs> you know what, let's go back to London. I'll drive. Let's get lunch. <laughs> yes, and we we get a nice scene with Newt and Anathema. She's I think she's in the shower when the door rings and Newt answers and they're like, 
uh, you knew uh, Newton philosopher? Yes? Good, we got something for you. And he gets very dramatically delivered a box. Dun, that, dun, dun. Yeah, has been in storage for forever and was supposed to be delivered on this day at this time. And then, like, they open up the box and then they just start running because there are letters in the box addressed to the delivery guys just mm. telling them, you better fucking run now because I know about what you did on that day. <laughs> And it turns out that our good old Agnes wrote Agnes another Nutter, witch. Yes, uh, wrote another prophecy manuscript, and it's just like, oh God, this will never end. Dun dun dun. <laughs> so tiny set for a sequel. sequel? <laughs> I think yes. there is a sequel. No. Nah. So possible sequel. Possible sequel. Yeah. Well, seeing how Terry Pratchett isn't alive anymore, it would be different. Oh, yeah. So they had plans for a sequel, but after Terry Pratchett died, Gaiman wrote in one of his essays titled uh, Terry Pratchett and Appreciation that he wasn't going to write it. Yeah, they done and I think that's, it's, I think that's good, because on one hand, it wouldn't have been the same anyway. Yeah, I think it's a nice Aziraphale and... Crowley. Yeah. Just um, side adventures through time would have been really nice. <laughs> yeah, which I mean is something that the show made up. It's not nothing in the book about their history together. The only thing that's mentioned is them like in the Garden of Eden together. Well, uh, in the audiobook they there's oh there even I think there was a reference to it. The cross dressing episode that, you know, in the past <laughs> So they clearly they've been around and they've had adventures. I, so from the TV show, my favorite one is the William Shakespeare one. <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. What does your friend think? He's not my friend. <laughs> I do not know this person. <laughs> uh, and oh, it's like a miracle for William Shakespeare to get off the ground. <laughs> yes. I mean, just the interaction between the two of them is always great. Like that um, that scene where they're in front of the bookshop about to go in to get wasted <laughs> and Israel just going, get thee behind me, you foul thing. <laughs> oh, after you. <laughs> it's just adorable. Um, yes, so next we have the beautiful scene between Shadwell and the Jezebel of them arriving. The Yes, arriving back at home and having a bit of a discussion about, well, maybe it's time for him to retire and settle down. <laughs> He's like, what, 100 at this point? <laughs> at least, probably. And she's like, you know what, that actually sounds pretty good. And, I mean, him finally admitting that he fucking wants her. That he thinks she is attractive. Yeah. And then drinking Guinness <laughs> in the scene. <sighs> and I love, I love their their story ending basically on uh, the witchfinder Sergeant Shadwell took a long deep drink of Guinness and popped the question. Madam Tracy giggled. Honestly, you old silly, she said, and she blushed a deep red. How many do you think? <laughs> he popped it again. Two, said Madam Tracy. <laughs> And he just said, oh, well, that's all right then. What? Oh, <laughs> sorry. He asked how many no question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how could he ever retire together with her if she had more than two nipples? Yeah, but he's been misinformed about the nipples. <laughs> and it's very cute because in the end it's just, oh, well, that's all right then. Said, which friend are Sergeant Shadwell? And then just retired. <laughs> So yes, we have a we have a cutesy ending for them, basically. Yeah. And then we we have a small bit about Crowley and Aziraphale just going for lunch, basically. Let's go to the Ritz. I'm hungry. Which is pretty much just their ending in the end. There isn't anything big or dramatic, really. 
they don't get punished by hell, heaven and hell. <laughs> no, that's that is really just for the for the TV show invented. Um, heaven and hell, at least according to the books, heaven and hell decided to pretend like none of this ever happened because it was slightly embarrassing. <laughs> Seeing how everyone waited for the apocalypse and then a little boy came and said, I don't want to do it, and everyone had to accept that. Yeah, interesting that that's how you would go about setting up uh, your son, Satan. <laughs> yeah, like, great job. Maybe a bit more fathering would have been good here. Yeah, but where's your... You, you, you sent... One demon to influence? A demon that, like, everybody was pretty suspect of anyway, like... Yeah. So, and then we have the the book and the story um, just ending, similar to the TV show, I think, just ending on Adam and his friends. Playing moving, about, or... Yeah. Moving about, playing, and... I wonder how much of his powers he kept. Like, so yeah. he's described by Anathema as, like, the face of a prepubescent Greek god, like, he's, he's a cherub, he's gonna do bad things with that face in the future, like... <laughs> yes. They're the kind, of, the kind of men they don't make anymore. So, you know, I want to know what he gets up to. Yeah, I mean, the, the last page is just, if you want to imagine the future, imagine a boy and his dog and his friends, um, imagine a summer that never ends, imagine a boot... No, imagine a sneaker. Lace is trailing, kicking a pebble. Imagine a stick to poke interesting things to throw for a dog that he may or may not decide to retrieve. <laughs> oh, <laughs> isn't that the truth? Imagine a tuneless whistle, uh, pounding of luckless popular songs, and imagine a figure, half angel, half devil, all human, slouching hopefully towards Tedfield. So it sounds like he turned out fairly normal and human. Yeah. But in love with Tadfield. <laughs> yes, which, you know, better than a lot of... I mean, better than being in love with heroin, so... <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's <laughs> your standard. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to set them low. Right, yo. Never have children. Um... <laughs> I mean, I officially, I cannot... I cannot advise that for people, <laughs> but on a personal level, yeah, maybe think about that one. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so really good book. I really liked it. I loved all the, I the laughing I got out of it. Deep. Yeah. And the TV show was really good, too. I think Tenet and Sheen were, like, the perfect... Oh, perfect casting. Casting. I mean, I'm just pretty much in love with most of the things that David Tennant does, particularly when he's suave. Yes. Ugh. Yes. I mean, I have to say I wasn't that big of a fan of giving him red hair instead of black, like in the books. It looked a bit strange, yeah, but... Yeah, but anyway. And there were there were a couple of changes from, from the books, and actually I found an interview with um, Gaiman where he said that he put some changes into it just to keep the people who knew the books on their toes. Uh -huh. Basically, like, not like the whole G Game of Thrones thing where up until a certain season everybody knew what was going to happen who read the books. He's just like, no, I'm going to throw some mystery in here. Yeah, I'm just going to fuck with you. <laughs> Basically. I mean, it was really cute that he did the show anyway because in an interview he said that he personally never wanted to make a TV show. There was always... Pratchett, who, who had yeah. the idea, and he really hated the idea of turning it into television. But then as a kind of homage to Pratchett, he decided he, he would make a TV show out of it. Yeah, but um, didn't Pratchett write most of the screenplay before he died? Um, I'm not sure if they, like, how much of that they actually got down before that. All right, like, what does Wikipedia say? Oh, good questions. But no, at any rate, I did very much like that. And the, he also said that the things that needed to be cut in order to fit it all into the episodes and stuff were always scenes that Gaiman wrote because he couldn't bring himself to cut something from, from Pratchett. It was very adorable. So cute. Yes. That's the kind of friendship that you want. Those are friendship goals right there. Yes. Unlike ours. Um, 
Ouch. That hurt. Mm, truth hurts. Mm. Okay. So, all around, very wholesome. Very wholesome. Love this book. Great read. Written by intelligent people who will stick a pun in literally anywhere as best as they can. <laughs> yes. And to you the may have of everyone. Yeah, you may have to Google some of the things that you don't understand because that's also a pun. <laughs> yes, definitely. Like us Googling anathema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's there's some background reading involved, but it does make it better. Yeah. And yeah, if you don't really have time for the book, watch the TV show because then you're just missing the nuance of the book basically. And and honestly, the audiobook, the dramatic version, dramatized version, is pretty damn good too. Okay, yeah, giggling out loud fun. and me- making people listen along with me. It's only yes. about four and a half hours, so. <laughs> I mean, that's actually pretty short if you think about it. It's two days worth of driving to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. That was good omens, yay. Yeah, it was great. Love it. Go do the things. And then like this podcast on Apple things. and <laughs> Yes, listen to it on Apple Podcasts and then listen to it again on Spotify. Cause and on YouTube. Because definitely yeah. not the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, follow but, us on all the social medias under To Read Lightly. Do all the subscription things, click all the buttons. You can check out our website, which is treadlightlypod.com. You can donate and help support us. We also have links to Spotify, uh, YouTube, and our Facebook page. So you can join in on the, all the fun and exciting things. Get notified that we're doing another episode, which come out every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In Australia, which is what time where you are on tracks? Um, hold on. If it's five your time, it's like some point in the morning over here. <laughs> so how, Sunday how, how morning. How is that for accuracy? <laughs> It'll be up on Sunday wherever you are because it's up on a Sunday in one of the first places to get Sunday. So yes. So if you're sitting around on a Sunday thinking, what am I going to do now? Why it's don't probably you have <laughs> Yes. We should get more professional in this. Probably. Also, if you don't know what else to do, just write something. Like, give us a review or comment. Yeah. Rate, review, subscribe on our YouTube channel. Leave an iTunes review. We'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at treadlightlypod at gmail.com. You can message us on Instagram or Facebook. We're around. You can annoy us on pretty much any platform, basically. Yeah. Let us know what you think, um, whether you find our voices annoying or uh, if you really rather we didn't drink as much tea during the episode. Whatever. 